Okay, okay, is the mic working? Yeah. No? Yeah? Okay. Um, just turn on timer size. Sub tracker time. So how the heck does it go? All right. Yeah, super excited to be here with you guys. As Katie said, my name is Luke. I went to University of Alabama for all time. And it's so great. I'm so excited to be here with you guys because this was a huge part of my story, my testimony, and how I came to know God was by sitting in your guys' shoes. And so I'm just like overjoyed and all about it uh, when uh, Katie gave me the opportunity, asked me to come speak. I was like, okay, well, what do you want me to speak on? And she's like, well, can you talk about living as a Christian in college? Living as a Christian in college. And I'm like, oh, man, that's my bread and butter. I'm about it. I talk to people about this all the time. Really fired up. It's a big topic, though. And we don't have that much time. So I'm going to condense like what I normally meet up with people about. And no, I'm going to try to go with a hybrid approach. Let you know. I'm going to try to give a little bit of an overview while also giving some practical stories. I'm a very practical person. I like tangible examples uh, and images. And knowing that I don't have the most amount of time, and I also just would love to, to stay back. If anybody wants to meet, go over some of these things. I'll do the best that I can to try to give explanations of, of points that I make. But if you feel I fall short or have any questions, again, please come talk to me. That's all preface uh, for this thing. Okay, yeah, I think I did a good job. Just very quickly want to do one more time. It never hurts to invite the Holy Spirit anymore. And I just want to really just take a moment, invite the Holy Spirit, okay? Holy Spirit, we come before you with expectation. Holy Spirit, you are inviting your Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Holy Spirit, come fill our hearts. Holy Spirit, I pray that you use me in whatever way you desire, that whatever is of you, may it plant a seed in someone's heart, that it bears fruit, that it germinates, agitates, and grows, bears fruit in their life and relationship with Thy God. We adore you, Holy Spirit. We're about your work here. In the name of Jesus Christ, we say this time. Amen. Amen. Ah, just always got to do that. Always got to be open to the Spirit and where He's moving. So, with this talk about, okay, living as a Christian in a college environment, really kind of the main image that I had as I was preparing for this is the thought of, okay, if I'm trying to get to a destination, like what's my goal? What am I about? And for this talk, okay, as a Christian, I'm trying to grow in my faith. I'm trying to grow in the love of God. I'm trying to become more and more like Jesus Christ. That's my destination. That's the path I'm trying to be on. But what's the environment that I'm in? I'm in the college environment. What is the college environment? What is the culture there? Does that propel me in that direction? Are people at college naturally tending towards greater zeal and love of God and evangelization and being on fire? And like, uh-uh. And so I had this image of a river. A river flowing opposite of that, actually pushing you away. Now I was just sober. There's a, I'm actually terrified of open water. But there were a few times my coach forced me in my pool, chucked me in a river, and I had to swim. And one of the things you know if you've ever been in like a big, strong, real river is that current is powerful. And, and there really isn't any way for you to just kind of stay still, to stay where you're at. Like, okay, well, when, when the current's like kind of eased up, then I'll be able to like advance to where I'm going. It's like, no, either you are going all out and you're making some ground, or you're falling back. And so, too, I think that's a great image for the Christian life. And I want to propose just three things, three things to you, three, in my mind, pillars that are going to help plant you, give you some stability, and give you propulsion to go forward it, towards that end game. What is the end game? Growing in love and knowledge of God. Right? Becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. That's the name of the game. That's what we're about. That's what everything should be about. Does that sound good? Everybody with me? Everybody tracking? Everybody awake? Okay. Now, I do want to say that I um, hope to motivate you guys, hope to give you guys practicals, and I also hope to make people uncomfortable in this room. When I read the gospel, when I read Jesus Christ, so few people ever walk away and be like, wow, that was great. Like, I'm feeling great about myself. <laughs> like, there's, there's something challenging inherent to the gospel. There's something about it that makes people uncomfortable because it's true, and it grates against us in a certain sense. And so that is actually my goal, and I'm letting you guys know that right up off the bat. So again, destination. We want to grow in love of God. We want to grow in a relationship with Him. Well, for, for reference, how do we grow with anybody in our lives? Spend time. Spend time. There's no other way. The iron law of human. There's no other way to, to grow in a relationship with somebody in your life other than to spend time with them and to talk to them. Now, I'm a swimmer. Of course, uh, everybody knows Michael Phelps. Now, I can learn a lot about Michael Phelps. I can read all kinds of articles about Michael Phelps. I can go talk to people that knew Michael Phelps. I can watch footage of Michael even. 
But I will never start to have an actual relationship with Michael unless I go and I talk to him. That's the only way it becomes personal. And so, too, okay, if that's the only way that we grow in a relationship with people in our lives, that's the only way we know how to grow in a relationship with people, that's the key. The number one first pillar, you want to grow in a relationship with God? Pray. Probably the most unexciting answer I probably could get for that one. Um, pray. Because if we, if we were to bring a five-year-old in here and they ask you, what is prayer? You'd probably say, it's just simply talking to God. It's a conversation with God. That is how you grow. Like, if I said nothing else in this talk, like this is the number one thing I'm going to try to spend the most time on this. Because it's the most important. Nothing else matters if we're not praying. Praying is everything. And we get this with relationships, right? Like, say, and I hate this language and I'm just going to give this claim, right? I would never use this, but... Um, say I came in here and I was like, okay guys, things are going great. I got a boo and we're talking. <laughs> you guys would know by me saying we're talking that, oh, Luke's in a relationship. Say three months later, they let me come back here and speak. And I'm like, all right guys, rough times with boo. We're not talking. <laughs> you guys would know by me saying we're not talking, we're not in a relationship. And it's actually not like we recognize that, say, you're texting someone every day. You're really um, interested in them. And then you guys just stop. It's not like the relationship stops and freezes. And then say you talk three months later, you just pick back up. It's like, actually, no. All that time added distance between your relationship. Again, that image of the river, you start flowing back. And so as Christians, if, if our destination, again, just kind of keep pointing to that, keep our, our mind on what are we trying to do. We're trying to grow a relationship with God. We need to be talking to him every single day. Some practicals. What do I recommend to people? 20 minutes is a starting place for prayer every single day. And what do I mean when I say talking to God? Or when I say prayer? I think one of the reasons why that's so bland to most people is because I think well, the way that I was raised, at least, is when I hear prayer, I hear talking to God, or I hear, like, okay, um, either routine prayer or maybe reading the Psalms, um, all wonderful things, all good things. But let's just flip that for like a human relationship. Let's say you want to talk to like one of your girlfriends, uh, ladies. Like let's say, okay, I want to talk to my girlfriend. We're going to go meet up at this coffee shop. You set up a time, set up the place, and you sit there and you're waiting. She shows up five minutes late. She's just like, poof, busts through the door, slams down the coffee, and she is off to the races. And before you can get a word in, she is telling you about her day, what she's gone through, what her thoughts are, things going on with the boy. Um, here's a list of things I really need your help on. And then she's like, you know what? This is great. We'll have to do this again next Sunday. And then she leaves. You'd be like, what the heck just happened, right? Like, I called you. I, I was the one who initiated this. I wanted to speak to you. Now, I don't know if Katie said, but I'm, I'm a Catholic missionary. One of the uh, things I find very beautiful in Catholic theology is about prayer. And it is this. We have one word for, like, what, how would we define prayer? And it's a response. That prayer is always a response, that, that we are never the initiators. We aren't picking up the phone to call God and to ask him or to, to try to beg for his attention. That any time you or I ever go to pray, we are only possible and able to do that because God is sitting there waiting for us, trying to get our attention, wanting to talk to us. That is one of the most beautiful, consoling things that I know of in this life. And so think of that. If, if God is the one calling you, wanting to speak to you, maybe he does want to say something. Maybe he wanted... Um, to speak of, in, to something you're asking questions. I think how many times would I, I thank God in prayer? Be like, Lord, please tell me, like, what am I supposed to do with the girl? Or what should I do with the job? Or what should I do about this? And then I would never stick around to hear. You even give God space to speak. Right? That if he's the one initiating, we want to create space for him to listen. Uh, for him to speak. Excuse me. It reminds me of, uh, and why would I say Silence. One of my favorite biblical heroes is the prophet Elijah. I love the prophet Elijah. Maybe you guys are familiar with the story of Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19. You can read the story of Elijah going to the cave. He feels called. God, the, the word of the Lord appears to Elijah. He says, go up to this cave. Go, go into there on this mountain. The Lord, the Lord is going to pass by. And so Elijah goes up this mountain. He goes to this cave and he hides himself and he waits. And what happens, it says, Scripture says, a strong wind, so strong that it rends the mountain, shakes the mountain, mighty power beyond imagining, Elijah stays in. And then what happens next? An earthquake shakes the whole foundation, shakes everything that Elijah's in, he stays in. 
Then a third thing happens. Fire is raining down, and Elijah stays in. I mean, beautiful line said, in a still, small voice. So Elijah covers his face and steps out to the wind. It's like that is prayer. That is a beautiful image for prayer. The silence of prayer. For God speaks most clearly, most powerfully, and most loudly in silence. So we need to be taking that time each day to listen to God. And just like I think at a base minimum in a conversation you're trying to grow with somebody, there's a time for talking and a time for listening. That's why I say the 20 minutes, the 10 and 10. At a minimum, 10 minutes. A couple caveats I just want to share um, about prayer. Again, like this is the number one thing. Like why do I keep talking about this and giving you all kind of different imagery? Because if you want to grow in your relationship with God, this is the bona fide of 100%. I, I would bet my entire life on this. This is the way. To grow, to speak to God, to hear, to, to get to learn His voice. Um, just one more image again. I, I, I'm very much a tangible person, and it always helps me to, to make it real, to make it real in my life. That if I were to, let's say, five years from now, I came to you, and I'm like, all right, I'm living out of marriage. Um, got this great wife, we've been together five years, you know, I'm, I'm just living, husband all the way, I'm about it, preach, all this stuff. Um, you know, we, we talk once a week on Sunday. Don't worry, though, guys. Like we're, we're talking actually every day. I give her high fives before meals. You'll be like, what are you doing, you dummy? Like, that's not the husband who knows his wife's voice. That's not the husband who will be able to differentiate his wife's voice from all the other voices that come into his head. Right? Like, if we see that in marriage, we realize how, how wrong that would be there and how that would be so lacking of a beautiful dynamic relationship between spouses, how much more so with God when we want that, that same kind of connection where we start to learn his voice. Now, silence, a brief word on that. I don't know, probably a lot of you guys don't take any time in your day for silence. I know I didn't for the longest time. Think of, if you even for the briefest moment think that you're bored, what's the go to like pull out the phone, right? Gotta check social media, check email, check text, um, watch YouTube. I mean anything. We're just constantly just trying to be entertained, trying to have noise. You go into a car, everybody always wants to play music right away, right? Or listen to a podcast. So just there's, there's always something to entertain, always something um, to create this noise. But imagine if you just stopped. Imagine if you just stopped in the still, small voice. Like what would happen? And again, I'm going to propose that same thing again. That God speaks clear, the, the loudly and the clearest in silence. Um, oh man, prayer is so good, y'all. I'm trying to think if I want to share some other imagery. Because anybody who has ever up, taken up the action of daily prayer, and particularly trying to sit in silence in prayer, knows that not only is it very difficult, but it can be very dry and boring. So two things come to mind when it happens. This is where when Jesus talks about going and praying in secret comes into play. The living the Christian life in college, what does that mean? A lot of this is going to be, like, no one's going to know. Like, I'm not going to be there. None of these people are going to be there when you wake up tomorrow morning and you decide, am I going to spend this 20 minutes with God? And anybody who tries to do it, okay, like, maybe you can get, like, excited. Or hopefully, I, I pray that something is getting stirred in your heart saying, it's like, maybe I want to try this out and commit to doing it for a week. Okay? Anybody who's tried to do it for long periods of time knows it's very difficult. Knows there's all kinds of things that are going to compete for your time. It's much nicer to stay inside of that warm bed, right? I'm not going to feel like it. What about when prayer gets dry? What about when I don't get the answers I'm looking for? What about I pray for peace and I don't end up with peace? Do we drop off? Do we hold God hostage and say, unless you give me what I'm looking for, I'm not going to spend time with you? It's like, whoa. No. Just like in a marriage. That your love, it stays in the form of words until it comes to when it's hard. It's only when you put your words into action that your love is validated. And it becomes in its truest sense, right? When a husband is beat tired after working all day, he's had a rough day, got crap from the boss, work didn't go right. He's already in a bad mood. And he goes back home. And on his way home, he goes out of his way to like buy flowers for his wife. And to listen there and to be there for it. And vice versa. I mean, like, that, not that beautiful? Who doesn't want that in a marriage? 
Because that's where love is truest and purest. And same thing when it comes to this habit of daily prayer. When you don't feel like it is the most important time for you to show up. And that is the name of the game, showing up. Above all things, consistency in prayer, showing up. It doesn't matter if your mind wanders. Yeah, you're probably not going to be able to slow your mind. That, that 10 minutes of silence might be agony for you at first. Think about it. Keep the image of God being a father. And we're all just children. Because that's what we are. I mean, we're spiritual children. Probably, again, I'm saying this. This might be the first time somebody's talked to you about prayer, sitting in silence. Probably start off, it, it, it's not going to happen. Your mind's going to be racing. You think about all these, all these other kind of things. And your mind's going to wander a lot. It's like, think of like a child. Does, does a father get upset when that little baby is just like, ah, ah, ah. It's like that father is delighted that that child wanted to climb up in his arms and try to sit with him. So too, think of how happy your heavenly father is when you want to take time out of your debt. He knows all the other stuff you could be doing with that time, but you choose to give it to him. And think of how much more beautiful when it, when it hurts, when it's hard, when you don't feel like it. You are still choosing with the, the truest form of love, which is from the will. When you don't get anything out of it, you're saying, God, I love you. I love you. So that's number one. That is the first pillar. That is the first foundation. If you want to grow in your relationship with God, that is the way. This is the way. Bonafide 100%. Take it to the bank. I'm telling you guys, try it out. That is the challenge I give everybody. Try it for one week. Try it at least 20 minutes. See what happens. Like, notice what happens in your day when you invite God in. I always recommend do it in the morning because you can always control 20 minutes of your morning. Losing, at the very least, say your, your schedule is so jam-packed, you literally cannot find time anywhere in your day. Losing 20 minutes of sleep is not going to make or break your day. So 20 minutes every single day in the morning, talking, listening. Okay, I'm beating the horse to death. Second pillar, transition to. I really couldn't find a good word for this, but as I was praying, I was like, Lord, what should I share? What, what do I think is important um, for college students? Uh, one of the words that just went boom, ironic, is the mind. Your mind. Second pillar, you want to live as a Christian in a, a post-Christian culture on a college campus, is you need to take stock of your mind in two ways. Number one, you need to be aware. What are we feeding our minds? What are we taking in? Right? This takes the form of a couple things. Um, the books you read, the music you listen to, the movies you watch, right? Social media, and I, I'll even have a quick word on ads. I feel like a boomer saying that, but ads, <laughs> they influence you. Um, music, right? Like, and when I talk to people, I actually usually don't have to, I think I've got a lot of reasons of why this is so powerful. Music's very interesting because it actually will bypass your intellect and go right to your heart. Because when words are set to a certain rhythm, like we feel music, right? Music's different than other forms um, of art. And they, they, like it's so powerful that I, I'm sure you would even relate. Like I haven't listened. I, I could quote to you if a certain Eminem song came on that I haven't listened to since middle school because it's Eminem. Like I could quote most of that song. Like that's tucked away in here and in here. Like in that wild. And I'm sure you would have the same thing. Like there are songs like that that are just they get tucked away. And they form words that we use and they influence us. And they'll like, <sighs> remembering that we are the body of Christ. Like the, the scripture says, like you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. It's like, like the Holy Spirit. What are you filling your temple with? What language do you want written on the walls of that temple? Um, what messages do you want written there? It's important. Movies, books, why, why do I highlight that? Is because that actually is giving you a lot of information about uh, what does it mean to be happy? Where do you get your ideas of masculinity and femininity? Where do you get your ideas? One of the examples I would give for this is like rom-coms. How many people are so influenced by what they think a relationship should look like, except by like what they see in the movies? And it sounds kind of goofy, but I, I would reckon a lot of us live out of that. Now I gotta say, I'm, I'm a huge mom with boy. My dad was in the military, and so my mom, um, Bless her heart, she had three boys, my, my dad was gone, and she had breast cancer at the time, just a heroic woman, and I'm very, very close to my mom. My mom liked to watch rom-coms, so I grew up watching a lot of these things with my mom, and from that, I always felt like I'm a, a hopeless romantic myself, and when I started to realize 
Like, where was I getting my idea of like, what a relationship should look like? It was from those freaking movies. And it, it sounds kind of silly, but I, I will tell you this. Because these movies and these shows, these things that we read and what we see, are like they, they put such an emphasis on the emotions of a relationship, right? That it should just be butterflies and rainbows and just explosions in the heart and things set to a song. It isn't this wonderful and this huge heroic acts that the man does for the woman. Like, I would say that there is something true and beautiful in that. But then think of how many relationships are ruined because they stop feeling those things. Or maybe you felt that, right? They're like, okay, I think I, I see this stuff. I'm not experiencing that. There must be something wrong with the relationship because the feelings aren't there anymore. I don't feel the same way about Google that I used to feel. And it's like, oh my gosh. So many people fall into that trap, particularly in college. And I think that that's part of it. Like, what do we, again, what do we feed in our minds? The fuel that we take in is going to influence the output we get out. And I, 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 I say the thing about social media, that's, that's a no-brainer. I mean, like, everybody talks about that. It's like beating to death. But we're still using it. Right? I mean, I don't want to call anybody out, but it's like, if, if we were to go to your phone right now and look up, like, screen use, like, would you be... How would that look? Like, how much time are you spending on social media? Think of all that stuff that it does. Think of, like, women, like, how that makes you compare to other women. Men, like, what do you, what do you see on them? How it makes you look at women. Like, it does influence us. To give you an example, like, why did I bring up the ads thing? The ads thing is such a great, uh, it makes it so poignant because this past year was a record-breaking year, and I believe, I believe the number was, like, 15 million dollars companies, Fortune 500 companies were spending for about 15 to 20 seconds of your time. Now, do you think those companies who have billion dollar psychology research firms working with them and will spend 15 million dollars for 15 seconds of your time, they will spend all of that because it doesn't influence you. It doesn't affect you, right? They know that. It's like, oh my gosh. They know if they can just keep getting something in front of you in enough time in the right way, they can influence your thoughts, they can influence your behavior, they can influence so much, right? So we as Christians, if we're living in a culture, our end goal, again, is knowing and loving God, growing to be more and more like Jesus Christ, we need to start being aware of that. We need to start being aware of what are we putting in our minds? How am I forming myself? Now, I'm not saying that you only listen to praise and worship and watch Pure Flix movies. Those things suck. Right? <laughs> I know. I've tried, and I can't stand it. Um, that being said, like there are good things out there. There are movies that portray the good, the true, and the beautiful. There are things that will draw you to God. You can see beautiful, wonderful movies. You can watch great shows. You can read incredible literature. It doesn't have to be explicitly about God. That will draw you up towards it. I don't have enough time to, to go into some of those things. Uh, okay, and the second part of the mind. Part one, what are we feeding? What are we putting in? We need to be conscientious. We really should not be, be feeding ourselves the way that everybody else is feeding ourselves. Part two is this. I think because, listen, you, you're big boys and big girls now. You're in college. Just like you start off when you're a little kid, like they tell you about chemistry, right? Um, I love chemistry. It was so fun. The old plum pudding model or the simple orbits of the neutrons um, and electrons and, and protons and all those things. Like, okay, that, that makes sense. But as you get older, you actually learn, well, that's not quite true. We gave you that because that's what you could understand at the moment. But the reality of things, it's a little bit more complex. It's actually more of like this. In, in, in your viewpoint changes and it matures and it grows to be more aligned with reality. How few Christians, they're Theology, their understanding of God stays like Sunday school level. Like knowing, like, okay, why do I believe in God? And it kind of stays at that level. It doesn't mature with all the other different thought processes in our lives. Right? We don't, we don't kind of keep forming ourselves. And like this is like the most important thing to know God. So what am I proposing? I'm not saying everybody here needs to go out and be an apologist and, and uh, be professional level with this. But I do think that you need to start forming and, and learning and asking yourself the big question and looking into this too. Uh, a few questions I'm gonna propose. But let me say why first, before I get to the questions, because I don't wanna get to the practicals first. The why is for your relationship with God. Because if you have reservations, if there are questions you have about Christianity, or being Christian, following Christ, 
um, that you've never asked or felt free to ask, that is a barrier to you stepping deeper into love. See, there's this interesting dynamic between knowledge and love that goes like this. That you actually cannot know or you cannot love what you don't know. That's why we go on dates with people. Right, to find out if that's who we want to marry because we needed to have knowledge about this person. And then once you have the knowledge, you can see and it lets you love them more. Right? And then we as Christians, how much more are we all about knowledge because we believe the truth, we worship the truth, literally. Jesus Christ says in Scripture, I am the way, the truth, the life. That there's nothing, everything that is true points us to the man. And so we need to know, like if there are any questions or barriers that you have about why to be Christian or, or um, what you believe, it's all for the purpose of you having a deeper relationship with God, removing any, any obstacles to that road, right? Clearing any debris off the road so that you can go all in, hit the ni uh, nitrous, just go. And it's also for other people in your life that you can help remove barriers in their life that maybe your study or, or you knowing some answers or you being able to explain why you believe what you believe removes a barrier for a brother or a sister that they might come to know God, that is an amazing thing to contemplate. That is a beautiful ability and power that you have in your life by taking some time to look at the big questions. So what are some of the questions? Of course, I'm sure you guys get this. You're in college. People probably ask at some point or talked about, okay, why do I believe in God? It's good. Okay, why do I believe in Jesus? Okay, yeah, those are those are foundational rock points. You need to be able to, to talk to people about that, to share. 1 Peter um, chapter 3, verse 15 says, always be prepared when someone gives an account to give a defense for the reason for your hope. For the reason for your hope. We always need to be prepared to, to answer these questions when people have them. So what are some other questions that I would propose? Okay, a bigger one, like why do we believe in the Bible? Right? Again, so many people do not we live in a post-Christian society. A lot of people don't understand like what Christianity even is. They don't understand like what Christians believe in. They sure as heck don't know why we believe what we believe in. And they're having non-Christians tell them, here's what, what, what Christians believe. And so that's why it like, really matters for you to look into this stuff and be able to try to talk about it. Okay, so why do I believe in the Bible? Why do I believe in God? Why do I believe in Jesus? Why do I believe in the Bible? Like, do I know where the Bible comes from? Do I know the history of the Bible? Why do we trust this thing? Have you ever asked like the, 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 the deeper questions? Um, yeah, why do I go to the church that I go to? Like, why, why this as opposed to something else? And I bring this up because imagine if you looked into this, how much more you would dive in. If you, if you saw this stuff and you saw it settled and you're pursuing truth, like how much more would you dive into that? How much more personal would that relationship with God be? It would change everything about you. It would change the game. That's why we look into this. That's why it's important. For your sake and for the people in your life that the Lord puts across. That's why you need to be prepared. 1 Peter 3.15. Always be prepared to give a defense for the reason for your hope. Um, I will say, just as an aside, I did bring uh, a couple books with me. I parked a little bit of weird. It feels kind of weird. Like, hey, follow me to the car. I'll get some books with me. But I, I, do, I do bring a couple books because that was a big part of my story. When I was in your guys' shoes, I didn't believe in God. I was an all-out atheist. I thought it was a bunch of crap. And because of the witness of one good Christian man who challenged me on why I should believe in God and why I should believe in Jesus, like that I'm alive at all. Uh, everything was changed because that man was prepared. So I genuinely have like just a few books if people are interested in anything um, from why I believe in Jesus, a couple, uh, case, for, case for Christ. Um, Least Trouble, Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis, things that had a big impact on me. And a few other books. Anybody be curious and look into that? Just want to offer. Uh, last thing, so I'm, I'm going a little over time. I, I will have the least practicals on this. Uh, if you want to talk about it with me, please, please come up at the end. Uh, the third pillar, right? So just to give a recap, I know I'm talking a little long. Thank you guys for bearing with me. First one, prayer, right? The only way to grow with someone, all grow in our relationships, to talk to them, to spend time with them. Number two, Right, is our minds being aware of the fuel we're putting in? Because it's going to dictate the output we're getting. And then um, starting to ask these deep questions. Like big boys, big girls, it's time to, to, to ask the tougher questions and to know. All for the sake of like that's what's going to lead to greater love. Then number three, 
This one, it's a little different than the other two because it's not an essential per se, but I wanted to comment on it uh, just in the slightest because this is one of the things I think we get swept away in the culture like nobody's business, and that's romantic relationships. Oh, buddy. Saw some heads prick up on that one. Yeah. Romantic relationships. This is one of the things I think I'm like most passionate about after love of God. It's like this dynamic between men and women. It is the most inter endlessly interesting thing to me. Um, partially because I did it so poorly. Partially because I was a dumpster fire for the longest time in this area of my life. And had a big wake-up call. Uh, was figuring I was about to... to planning on marrying somebody, and it didn't end up working out. And that gave me a ton of perspective, and I talk to people about this all the time, because I think in college, more than like anywhere else, this is like the most ugly situation. It's confusing, it's ambiguous, it's just kind of a, a hot mess all around. And more than giving practicals, again, I'm going to talk about practicals afterwards, anybody wants to talk about, but I really wanted to just give like this overview, something for you to just chew on, if nothing else. I thought that'd be good enough. Now, who here in this room wants to be married one day? Okay, okay. Who here in this room wants to have a wonderful, thriving marriage? All right, just make sure you guys are awake. Very good. Well, here's the reality. 50% of marriages end in divorce right now. Like, whoa. Like, oh my gosh. The second most important relationship in our life, right, Half of people, that is ending in tragedy and pain. And mercy, yeah, for those of you who came from that background, you know how painful that can be to not just that couple, but everyone in their life. It's like, okay, 50% swept off the map. Now, the 50% that's left, I'm just going to call on someone. How, what percentage, or maybe you just call out, what percentage of those do you think are living a marriage? You guys just said, everybody here, every single person raise their hands and they want a, a happy, wonderful marriage. What percentage of the 50 that's left, that survives, do you think is living that marriage that they are connecting and thriving uh, spiritually, emotionally, and sexually? Good guess. 15. 15? 15. 15. 15. 15. 7. 7. 7. 7. 4? 4? 4? Okay. 45. Okay, you're 45, <laughs> Yeah, I, I would propose, I would propose 3%. I would propose, I propose 3% of people are living the kind of marriage that if you were to describe your ideal, your dream, what you think is the best form of marriage, I think 3% of people are operating that way. Why do I bring this up? Because the Lord says, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, verse 43. Um, where is it? I, I didn't pull it up. This is where he talks about, you know a tree by its fruit. Right? A, a, a fig isn't pulled from a bramble bush. So if you know a tree by its fruit, what is the fruit of living out your relationship just like everyone else around you? Boom. 50% in the divorce. You think one three percent Maybe that's generous. Maybe it's not generous enough. But I think we would all agree. That at the very least, it's, it's well in the minority. right? Most people are not hitting the mark on this. And so if that's the case, if that's the fruit that's being born by this tree, why the heck are we still acting like that? Like, think about it. Now, again, I, I call it the 3% rule because it's like that's 3%. I'm so blessed in my life that I've, I've gone around and I've got to meet some of these incredible people people that have these marriages that just like, is that even real? What the heck? And I've actually been able to travel around and interview people about this and ask them, how did you do this? What was this like? And it's amazing to hear their stories, um, all kind of different backgrounds, people starting off the right way, people starting off the wrong way. One of the things that always gives me such hope is like, it's, it's never too late to change. People that came from such mess and such hurt and such confusion in their relationships, are able to turn around with God's grace. And you're, it's never too late to change, to set it off on the right foot, to invite God to be back at the center of that relationship. And I would just propose that those people live out a very radical, what, what most other people would consider radical or too much or whatever else, right? That might catch flack from other people. But again, who gives a rat's behind? Like this is your life. At the end of your life, 
This is one of the two things that are going to make your life a failure or not. No one ever in their life. Um, yeah. Oh, mercy. I, I, I've got, I'll go off on this, man. I'm getting so. I talk with people about this. Now the wazoo. Guys acting like clowns. Girls, I'm like, what are you doing? Um, what if there was a different way? What if there was a different way? What if there was a way that you experienced with your significant other nothing but joy and peace? It's very difficult, absolutely. But what if it, you take out some of these elements that just lead to such pain? Ah, nothing. Lord, stop it. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. Yeah. Stop there. Uh, happy marriages don't just happen. It takes grace. Uh, it takes a different kind of lifestyle. So just to recap on the end, uh, as I finish up here, what did we talk about? We talked about our destination. We talked about like what the heck we're trying to do with our lives. Grow closer to God. Fall more deeply in love with God himself and become more like the person of Jesus Christ. And how do we fight against this current that everywhere around us is trying to take us away from that or might be tending away in that direction, that strong current? We talked about, number one, the habit of personal prayer. The challenge is taking that 20 minutes every single day, preferably in the morning, at least have that time to listen to God and see what happens. Number two, our minds. Maybe it's time to make some changes with, with how we're spending our time and what we're taking in. It's time at the very least to take stock and maybe just ask some questions of, all right, if I really, really, truly believe that Jesus Christ is with me always, would I feel just as comfortable watching that show? Or listening to that music. Or like making him sit with me in this. I mean, it sounds kind of like goofy or, or, or maybe it's a little weighted. But it's like, is it true? Like, isn't he always with us? Isn't he Emmanuel? And like, does that change how you view something? I know that's been like a pretty sturdy guide for me. So that's on one hand. And then looking into these deeper questions in life. Asking the hard question. It's only all for the purpose of falling more deeply in love with God. Removing barriers that, make, that let you love God more. And then number three, maybe it's time to take stock and make some changes in your romantic relationships. Um, I got to just say this one last word on romantic relationships, one, one last word about marriage. Because everybody wants a great marriage, right? Everybody wants that. And it's good, and you should want that. You absolutely should. 100%. But... Let's give the example. Like, look at what you're willing to do to succeed in school. To, to um, we stick away from sports, right? But just even school is such a great example. To just get a degree, a degree that you may or may not even use for just a job. You spend how many hours in the classroom? You spend how many hours studying? You go out and find the best teacher you can. You go out and get tutors. You surround yourself with classmates who have the same objective as you, and then you're continually evaluating your progress through tests to see do I know the material. It's like, are we doing any of that to prepare to be a great husband and a great father, to be a great wife and a great mother? Like, oh, that's a good gut check, right? Like, these are the simple steps that we take when we want to be good at anything. It's the exact same thing with sports. It's the exact same thing in any endeavor. When you want excellence, you act a certain way. We all know that you need to surround yourself with like-minded people. You need to go out and find the best teacher that you can or a mentor who knows who's done it better than you or longer than you. Right? That we continually evaluate our, our, our progress through practice and putting it into work and saying, am I, am I hitting my goal? Am I doing what I'm trying to do? Right? Like all these things. And that's just what I want to propose. So even if you're not in a relationship, you can still do these things. You can still prepare for one if that's what your desire is. And that's where you think God is leading you to be called to be a husband and a father. It's time to start preparing. Same thing with uh, the ladies. If you're in a relationship, maybe it's time to make some moves. Some changes. Uh, okay, I talked just a little bit over. I apologize about that. Um, thank you guys so much for this time. I'd love to just close in a quick prayer. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Lord God Almighty, we come before you in total gratitude. We sing this in of praise. Thank you for this time. Thank you for the great ministry of FCA. Thank you for all these uh, men and women for showing up. Thank you for being here. Thank you for. Gosh, our lives, thank you for the clothes on our back, Lord. Thank you for that we don't have to worry about our next meal. Lord, we don't have to worry about where we're going to sleep tonight. So many people in this city cannot say the same, Lord God. 
And above material goods, Lord, you provide us with relationships. Thank you for our family. Thank you for our friends. Thank you for this community where so many have found a home. God, in the greatest and the most wonderful, the most dynamic of all relationships is the relationship with you. Thank you, God, that you sent your son so that I might have life with you by knowing him. Lord, what an, an amazing gift, the gift of all gifts. Relationship with Jesus Christ, eternal life through the gates of love. We adore you, O Christ. We praise you because by your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. We thank you for this time as we prepare for the season of Easter. Uh, my final prayer, Holy Spirit, is to you. I pray that whatever was of you, again, may it just be a seed that's planted in someone's heart, may it agitate, may it germinate, may it grow and bear fruit in their life. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Trust you. Whatever is not of you may be blown away like the chaff. We trust you. We devote it to you. Give us greater docility to your movements and how you're calling us to act. How you're inviting maybe someone in this room right now to take a step forward. We seal this prayer in the great name of Jesus Christ, the name that all creatures, all beings in heaven or earth, their needs to be forced to the ground in wonder and admiration because it is the most beautiful, the most lovely name that can be uttered. Jesus, we seal this time in your great name. Amen. Amen.